Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. In the light of the waning moon here, autumn time, we're gonna go ahead and take a new direction. Don't knock until you try it. There are some things I prefer to take your word for. We are going to use a novel tool uh, pumpkin carver. It's actually powder actuated, normally used for rapid onset lead poisoning. A G lock. Go get your pearls, Ma. You're gonna need something to clutch. Oh, all right, holy terror. Hey, black pew pew Glock 17 Gen 5, made in the USA. I probably flashed you the serial number there. You have to go back so you can, uh, yeah, yeah. I can assure you, although being wholly incompetent and shooting, I am fully qualified at owning, possessing, and uh, otherwise enjoying this powder actuated tool. I can see right now though, this is made for utilitarian purposes. Very lightweight, quite chintzy in the handle. It doesn't feel real nice. And we can see this is from G-Lock Austria, but I believe it's made in the USNA. And we can see some of them, Smyria, Georgia's, uh, yeah, completely the wrong kind of lubrication on this. Completely fucking brain dead. Have a look at this. I, the tiger, right out fighting with the Jesus camera for the focusing. Fuck. In any case, we can see amateur hour here on the back of the slide, which is really surprising, seeing as how many of these they have manufactured. What they got on here is copper never sneeze. Now, never sneeze compound is not a lubricant. It was never intended as a lubricant. What it is good at is preventing rusty bolts from seizing up in their threaded holes. You do not get any hydrodynamic slip with this guy. You don't get any slip with this because it actually has sand, silica di silicon dioxide, sand particles in it, compounded in it. So what they've gone and done is put grease with silica sand in the slide right from the factory. It's fucking brain dead. Totally the wrong compound to put on there. In addition, adding insult to injury, they've done and used copper. If you copper clad steel and the copper is intact, it's fine. But as soon as you uh, nick that copper cladding off of steel, it causes the steel to corrode even faster. It's the exact opposite of zinc cladding because of the uh, electronegativity of metals if you look at iron versus copper versus zinc, you'll see it creates a, a corrosion cell. Do not use Never Sneeze as a lubricant. It is not a lubricant. It is an anti-seizing compound. Unsurprisingly, because it is plastique, it's quite chintzy feeling in the hand, very lightweight. Now, very likely when you put the clipazine, glauca, glaucazine, glaucaclipazine into the receiver here, uh, it probably feels quite a bit heavy, heavier and nicer. Likely because of the weather, things tend to trickle up a little slower here. And affirmative action aside, legislatively, because this is big and black, we only have one permitted use where we can actually put the peas in the pea shooter, and that is at the range, on the range. So, off we go to meet the wizard. And as you can see, when you have the legitimate trigger lock, <laughs> it doesn't fit in the casement. In any case, it needs to be double locked and I need to proceed directly to the range. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200 doll hairs. Cross your fingies. They've circled the problem. Ah, fooled him again. Oh, tax dollars at work. I think it's uh, ah, Julie Nasrallah is on there now. Followed soon after by Tom Allen. And then Buddy Ganu, rich stir fry. I do love me a good rich stir fry, except those bastards at the Manchu Walk tried to kill me that one year. I feel smarter already. The old bird fucker only runs downhill. She's a little loose in the hips here. 
This public service announcement brought to you by the Never Come to British Columbia Association. Never fucking come here. It sucks. You ever go on a picnic in Bruges? Exactly. Oh, that's too bad. No Royal Canadians today. Do a bit of community outreach here. Normally fire off some of that sweet, sweet government roundage on their uh, on-duty hours. That's uh, too bad too, because they put away their target. It's a uh, it's a specialized target for here in Canada. It's a big red barn door. That's not an easy job, you know. People constantly they listen. They're just people. They eat their grin, fuck the shit out of their turd sandwich, one bite at a time, just like the rest of us. And imagine that you you got to go to work and deal with the same fuckheads every day. And I'm not just talking your superiors. I'm talking like your customers. Your clients are all the same fucking scumbags lying to you. Ugh. It's, yeah, I'm glad that they, they're well unionized and they get, you know, they they do their 25 years of service or whatever it is, and then they can go and have another career. They got the golden parachute. Fucking A, dealing with the scumbags of the earth. Good for them. More power to them, I say. And they're in a tough position here in Canada, too, the higher-ups, because we're in some ways, it's a police state. It's where the police actually make the laws, which is completely antithetical to any kind of Western democracy. Uh, according to my grade 10 civics class, anyway, I'm I'm no uh, I'm no scholar, but when the gov when, when the government tells law enforcement to make their own laws. There's a fucking problem there. So the, in Canada, the politicians, the political arm, have abdicated their lawmaking uh, in regards to firearms and just have the RCMP do it for them. So it's pretty fucked, actually. It's pretty fucked. And the rules are extremely Byzantine. Uh, Machiavellian, one might say. You never know if you're going to get hauled on to the clink for... for legitimately owning a pew pew or not it's it's not a good situation but it sure works uh it sure works to the bureaucrats and the career politicians favor unfortunately it leaves little guys comrades such as myself sort of uh sort of in a gray area my wife tells me i do some of my best work in the dark Didn't hit fuck all, but scared the shit out of it. Always got to give yourself some room for improvement. Also, it's harder than it looks. It's almost like it's a sport, like a target sport, like it ought to be in the Olympics or something. Maybe it already is. Maybe it's a legitimate sport. Imagine that. Scared that can right off the head. Look at us. Reasonably effective pea shooter. We're going to clean this up for the next guys. Well, because the next guy's going to be me. And we'll head on back to the hacienda and have her a part. No matter how big and tough and mean the man, he was once a little boy, whittling stakes and making bow and arrows in his grandma's backyard. We, uh, we forget that at our peril, I think. And I, we do our kids a disservice by not letting them mess around with dangerous things. Having said that, this is not for kids. It ain't the fucking movies, partner. You have no idea about a firearm and you pick it up, you're going to shoot yourself right in the fucking face. Hot lead comes out of this end. And all you got to do is pull the trigger with but 
four or five pounds of force. It's, you know, little Johnny going through grandma's in the States, this happens quite often. Little Johnny going through grandma's purse looking for some candies. Kablooey blows his face off. No, no, what about that time he shot his sister? Yeah, well, that happens too once in a while. It ain't no fucking joke. These are <laughs> not toys, even though they are very, very enjoyable. Pew, pew. Blasted through 100, 120 rounds there. You can see we, we put a fair few pellets through her. I uh, had a misfire on this cheapo uh, Remington. Look at this. She popped. I don't know if there was no primer in there. It doesn't look like, I don't know. doesn't look like there was primer in there. That's a fair few rounds right off the hop. I can feel it in my back. And the reason I cycled through, I was trying to get a bead on where that sight was to. It's just, at first I thought it was me, and then, uh, yeah, I, I got composed, and it's way off in the fucking rhubarb. So I'm trying to get a bead, 2.9, on why it would be so far off. Uh, it was 8 inches to the left and about 12 inches down, and I know that because my wife tells me it's but 3 inches, but smells more like a foot. I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. Maybe they're not using Never Season. It's some special 11 herbs and spices, specially compounded just for Glock. It doesn't have the anti-galling property. So what? the reason you would lap it is so that you have enough contact area or not yeah contact area instead of peaks and valleys in the uh, grain structure of the metal because the metal is not uniform it's grains right it's it's like an aggregate rocks together all all so in order to get that to uh, be smooth you need to take off the, the the pokey bits and what that aids is that aids you to go into far more easier hydrodynamic slip so if you have a fluid, be it air or liquid or grease, a uh, real viscous fluid, what can happen is if the thing moves far enough, you get shear in that fluid, you get hydraulic shear, the pressure goes up. Now the pressure goes up against the two mating forces. It brings them up apart. So you can see that in guys who have um, hand uh, scraped machinery components you can see that they'll have a big block and I'll, I'll link in here. There was a Russian dude what did it and uh, put a hell of a lot of work into a big steel piece. And just with air, once he gets it moving, the thing slides, this big chunk of iron slides because of hydrodynamic slip because the surfaces are so uniform that you can build the pressure up in that air from shearing and it lifts off and you essentially get very little friction. So I think what they're trying to do here is to get this lapped, but they're omitting that step in their manufacturing and handing it off to the consumer to do for them. You have a look at this. We're already rubbing off here on the slide catch. Already. Well, let's see if I can do this the first time here. Cock it. Pull the trigger, dry fire, and then let it go like this, and go like this, and then go like this. Uh, 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 uh. Many hours later, eh, eh, eh. Ah. This is incredible. These G-Lock guys, they ain't dumb. All of the components, there's a hell of a lot of engineering in here. And it's not performance engineering. It's, uh, it's cost engineering. The fact that the marketing department can, can garner, oh, 800 doll hairs, uh, a, a pistol out of this. And, just think of how many mags they sell as well, magazines, clip of, clip of mag glockazines. All of the components are all punch pressed and bent. Even the ones injection molded, or is it injection molded? This is a very stiff plastic and there's no indication as to whether it's nylon, but I believe it's polycarbonate. The only way to do it is to, uh, 
do the sniff test. The old Hiko hotting up off by six, that'll do. Uh, we gotta figure out how this is made. And I'm not sure if it's a, uh, an epoxy resin or if it's a like a thermoset plastic or if it is a thermoplastic. Thermoset plastic, it only chooches once and then once it's set, you cannot melt it, it only burns. And a thermoplastic can be remelted. So if it's a thermoplastic, it's very likely going to be either polycarbonate or like a tool battery, nylon, which would be PA6. We don't know what this is, it might be polycarbonate, but it's very likely got some either glass fiber or uh, glass beads, glass balls, or carbon fiber. Now, this is very well made and we can see it's injection molded because there's an ejector pin and also a mold line where the halves of the mold come together. So you would mold it in a very, very well made mold uh, uh, under high pressure and this would be melted so it would be liquid you squirt that in there and then you cool it down. It solidifies, then the mold opens and the pins boop, pop that out. And you can see as evidence by the mark there that you can, as I said, plainly see. Now, what you gotta do here to see if there's any glass fiber is cut it and listen. And you can hear it's scraping away a little bit. So that might be glass fiber reinforced, say 20 or 30%. Now the higher the glass fiber in there, the harder it is on the mold. The molds wear out quicker and that means that the uh, tool or rather whatever's coming out of the mold is more expensive because the, the, the big huge expense in injection molding is the, the tooling, is, is the actual mold itself made out of uh, either H, well, D2 tool steel if and you're cheap, or H13 tool steel if you're going whole hog. Now, this thing is an incredible piece of engineering. What they've gone and done is they've, they've taken that uh, Kalashnikov idea where they took the SKS uh, rifle, the military rifle, the Russian military rifle, and that was, that's a fantastic rifle, but they made it even cheaper by going with a whole bunch of parts that were pressed and bent, punched out. So these are all sheet metal parts. They've made a precision sidearm, used the world over with plastic and bent sheet metal. Now anybody can throw together a bunch of parts, but the fitment, if, if you want, it's diminishing returns. If you want real tight tolerances, the costs go through the roof. And on these components, there are some incredibly tight tolerances. But we see on the slide itself, these are molded into the, molded in, and yeah, they're just bent. Close and real and careful listenly, you see this is the same process as these cheap washers which you get from... Uh, the homeless death spot. You can see the dye is cutting into it at the at the tippy top here, and then the material gives way. Uh, to, uh, you can see the lateral striations in the axis of of punching. That process does not lend itself well to accuracy. There is a lot of uh, there's a sloppy tolerance fit. What needs to be uh, made up for there, and that uh, indicates to me that the slide does have anti-seize on it, so it needs to be lapped. Listen, if it, if it looks like shit, if it smells like shit, and it tastes like shit, spit it the fuck out. In my opinion, that is never seize, and they're doing that so that it wears itself in, because you can't get real tight tolerances on these slides. It's a marvel of value engineering. Not to worry, it only hurts till you burn the nerve endings. What we wanna do is get a whiff of the stank of her. And as we're going in, we can feel the glass fiber. You can feel it fetching up on the glass fiber. If you give her the old Lee Trevino feather touch. Okay, that's got a whiff to her. Weird. It's a blend of something, 11 herbs and spices, but it's not pure PA66, I would say. It's probably proprietary. 
Oh, that's pretty close. I'm going to I'm going to say that's uh PA 6.6. Till someone tells me otherwise. You know, it would be fantastic if and you could if you if you work uh or have worked or you know someone who works on these if you could just fill in the blanks for us cuz that's the beauty of this whole YouTube thing is that it's not it, well, it's a discussion. The recoil spring, and we see two springs, so that's a, a differential rate. Two springs doing different things at different, well, essentially timing the plunger. And it looks like it's either been zinc plated or it is stainless steel. It might be stainless. We can check that. Now that is slightly magnetic, so it can't be stainless steel, right? Wrong. It could be a typical 301, um, 17 and 7. So that's 17% chromium and 7% nickel, austenitic. Even though it's non-magnetic 301 in its annealed state, when you cold work it, such as forming a spring, it develops some magnetism. The magnetic dipoles change because the crystal structure of the... Now we're getting into the good bits of the metal. Here's the firing pin. And it, it, to prevent, well, there's a bunch of safeties inherent in this, but I, I gleaned this from Hiscock 69's uh, soliloquy on Uzis coming from a, an older married man. The, the most important way to prevent accidental discharge, especially if you haven't uh, fired off in a while, is to jack off. But in this case, there's three actual safeties and the first is on the trigger itself. There's a little paddle switch what needs to be depressed for the trigger to uh, actuate. Then there's also a, a drop safety. If you look in there, there's a spring of a thing in there. That needs to be out of the way in order for the firing pin to release from the sear or the trigger. Probably the, the pin holdback or the trigger uh, release, I bet you they call it. And then there's also a um, there's also a firing pin safety pin here prevents it from firing unless there's a magazine in there. Is that right? But that needs to be depressed and that actuates on here and that's got actuates on here and that's got something to do with the magazine and the trigger all at once. There's all kinds of interlocks built into this is the that is why this is so clever because what you're getting is instead of electrical interlocks which you'd normally see on any kind of equipment in the modern age these are all old school mechanical interlocks where you can't scratch your nuts and whistle Dixie at the same time because the sear is holding this and that and, and so forth. The firing pin gets held by, back by the trigger and it gets cocked by bringing the slide back. It's ready to rock, cocked and ready to rock. Then when you depress the trigger, it releases off of here. And this little guy, as long as the safety is depressed, this little guy shoots forward. Just a wee pip, just a, a tiny, you'll be amazed. It just comes out of that little hole, pokes its head out just that much. And that's all it needs if you'd focus, you fuck. That's all it needs to depress that uh, center fire cartridge and blast it into a low earth orbit. And now the barrel itself, if you look down in there, you can see the rifling. That's where the name rifle comes from. That puts a spin on the bullet and allows it to travel far smoother. And you can see at the crown, it is uh, octagonal. or hexagonal. How many is that? Eight or six? It looks like six. And I don't know what that does, but I know that the rifling makes the, make, makes the, uh, it's probably some marketing wanketeering, but I bet you it's just an artifact of the manufacturer that they don't want to get rid of. So they label it uh, not a fault, it's a feature. Uh, because this is a semi-automatic, it needs to self-load in order to uh, auto-load in order to auto load, it takes a round from the magazine, gets pushed up by the spring, takes a round from the magazine. But before it does that, well, here's the barrel. Before it does that, it's in the barrel. The ejector claw, if you have a look here, you can see 
there's a little claw. That's the ejector. That indexes on this ridge, like so, pulls it back along with the slide, and then once it contacts, what would it contact? Would it contact this guy? No, that's part of the trigger group. It'd have to contact this guy, and it pops it out. Now, if you have a crappy round or a dud, uh, sometimes you don't have enough energy to automatically pop it out and you get a, a stovepipe feed failure. These guns are notoriously reliable and that doesn't happen very often. But if you have a, a cheaper gun, looser fitments and so forth, or too tight, you know, too tight, too loose or just crappy, what ends up happening is you get a stovepipe and uh, you have to clear that fault manually. No big deal if you're carving pumpkins, but if a bad guy's running at you, uh, he, you'll likely be uh, changing your drawers. Reiterating my amazement at the level of engineering uh, contained herein, I came into this thinking, ah, it's a plastic gun, a service uh, pistol. Eh, big deal. This fucking thing is incredible, and we see how close and how well engineered it everything has to be in order to get a, uh, a charge out of the end of the barrel consistently. That's the thing about this. It's consistent. Now you think about this in electronics terms, you have an if and an and and an and and an and and there's four interlocks there. There's four mechanical things need to happen in order for this to fire. And the, the amount of the, the amount of potential for a fault is just incredible because if one of those mechanical contrivances is just a little bit off, it ain't going to fire. The amount of time they have spent to make a very cheap to manufacture gun and charge a premium for it being extremely reliable and extremely light. All of the punched and pressed uh, metal parts, just incredible. And the fitment on them is absolutely incredible. The fact that <laughs> they get their customers to wear the gun in, uh, uh, incredible, brilliant. I mean, these guys have consumer commodity manufacturing down to an absolute science. These guys are fucking smart and it shows in the engineering and not, it's, it's, it's not beautiful. It's not a beautiful, it's not but it's very robust and it's very cheap to manufacture. That is extremely difficult to achieve and these guys have done it extremely well.